And he said, and I'll never forget this, it's so powerful. He said, in prison, the only emotion you're allowed to express is anger. And even then you have to be very circumspect about how you do it. Yes, so what you're referring to is the Queensland Shakespeare Ensemble's work that we call Shakespeare Beyond, because once a very clever man came up with that <laughs> phrase. I believe his name was Paul Adams. Yes, it was great. It's great. Thank you for that gift. My absolute um, pleasure. And the idea is that a lot of the work we do goes beyond what you might traditionally associate with Shakespeare. And the little slogan I think that you had for it, Paul, was beyond the page, beyond the stage. Mm. So um, Shakespeare beyond. Yonder. Shakespeare beyond. Needs, needs yeah. one of those trailer voices. Beyond the page. Beyond. This summer, one play. Yeah, that's what we need. One bard. Um, <laughs> One quill. Um, yeah, so beyond the page is not an uncommon thought. Like, you know, you can go to drama programs all over the place and they'll say page to stage. But we go, yeah, well, why does it have to stop at the stage? And one of the things that we find very both powerful and rewarding and challenging, which are three good reasons to do anything. Absolutely. Um, is work that we do with Shakespeare, mostly with Shakespeare, I'll stick to the Shakespeare stuff, um, off the stage. And I don't mean training actors because we do that too and, and not even necessarily like going to schools and doing schools because that's really still about the stage. Yeah. This is where the end point is, or if there is an end point, is not necessarily doing a Shakespeare play in a theatre. And it, for us, it did begin with the Shakespeare Prison Project, which started in 2006. It was modelled loosely on the idea of programs that we knew existed in the United States, but we didn't know much about them. Um, and the, the, well, the program, in short, is that a team of artists, and uh, in our case, it's, it's settled to about four artists, go into a high security prison, work with a group of volunteer prisoners. We like to start out with about 20, which usually for various reasons whittles down to about 12. We work with them for like one full day a week. Well, we start with three days in a row, bang, 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 intensive. And then one day a week over three months, three to three and a half months, uh, at the end, we also go bang, bang, bang three days in a row because it does culminate in a performance in the prison, um, usually in the mess hall, the officer's mess, which the officers aren't always happy about. Uh, <laughs> sometimes in the prison gym, which we're not happy about because the acoustics are awful and the folks won't stop working out in the corner. Like You cannot stop them from working out. You wouldn't want to try to stop them. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> cliche um but somewhat true uh and and they put on a a shakespeare play it's typically cut down to about an hour hour 15 to an hour and a half and the audience is um uh well it's evolved obviously yeah. in the last 15 years as you'd hope it would its current state of play is that there are three performances the first one is for uh invited fellow inmates. So each person, each of the prisoners in the cast can invite a certain number, two, three or four inmates um, uh, to come and see it. And also their friends and family. So these are people on the outside who must already have permission to enter to visit the prison. Um, so these are people that, that they might, so in many cases, they have never seen them before. Or they won't, haven't seen them in years, but they will come in to see the play. So that's the first performance. The second two performances, the following day, are for the general public. Um, so anyone can come to see them, but you have to you have to get clearance. So you have to fill in a form. It's not like you can't rock up on the yes. day and go, here's my 50 bucks, let me in. Um, you, you Scalper out the front out selling before. tickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty funny. Um, but yeah, anyone can come and see it. So so that's how it can't. And then and then we have a debrief session a few days later. Within the sessions, we actually do do a fair bit of rather than focusing on the kind of often skill specific actor training that we might do with our actors there's a little of that but more of it is getting into the the vibe of acting using um games and exercises from the theater of the oppressed which is um oh, 
you can look it up, Theatre of the Oppressed. Yeah. Augusta it's, Boal. Uh, it's a great way. Yeah, Augusta Boal's work. Actually, I, that's one of the links I'll, um, I'll pop in right. to the International Centre for Theatre of the Oppressed. It's a kind of participatory and democratic theatre style. And that's one of the things that is, is important about our work. Even when we then get on to selecting a play, the play is selected by the group, the whole circle. So it's not this year, and often we'll start and someone will say, so what play are we doing this year? And the answer is, well, we don't know, we haven't decided. Um, and the decision is made by the whole group. So you've got the group, which is, you know, a dozen to a dozen or more uh, prisoners plus four facilitators forms the group. And um, uh, essentially the we recognize that everyone brings specific knowledge. We, the facilitators, because we're from a Shakespeare company, yeah, we have probably, not always, probably more knowledge than anyone else in the circle about the plays that Shakespeare wrote and what the plots are. So we bring yeah. that knowledge and share it. But that doesn't translate to, therefore, we should decide you know, what play we do. That's a democratic decision. We always, I described it as a circle, we sit in a circle. So that in itself is often surprising um, to many of the prisoners because they think, oh, it's going to be a class because it's often the, the meetings are held in the education centre. The first thing we do when we arrive is we move all the tables and chairs out of the way, stack them in the corner. Uh, there is not a classroom setting and we sit on the floor in a circle. Everyone is sitting at the same level. Everyone is facing everyone else. And, that, and, and that's just how we operate in the theatre. Um, but in the prison context, that's unusual. And, mm. um, yeah, yeah. But anyway, sorry, I've moved on from uh, what is the project to... No, I think it's fascinating to hear how, how that is kind of taken into a setting like that. So, you know, there are... <laughs> structural differences there are um freedom differences in being able to move in and around those spaces and so i think it's fascinating yep. to hear how you know the company is able to take the work of shakespeare into that setting so what do you see the benefits of using shakespeare for this type of work if you talk to a lot of the american practitioners and, you know, Americans love to be evangelical about stuff. So they will tell you about how it's powerful and life-changing, which it probably is. Um, but they'll also talk about how it's Shakespeare is somehow magical or something. And so I'm slightly cynical and maybe not the best, uh, the best ambassador of our own work. <laughs> because what I will say is um, it's no different to what Shakespeare does in any other context. It's just that, this is where the, the apparent magic comes in, the sorts of things that doing theatre and particularly, I would argue, particularly Shakespeare, maybe and his contemporaries um, or plays of this type, the sorts of things that that requires of an actor and therefore promotes are the sorts of things that are generally not encouraged in a prison context. To a certain extent, they're not encouraged in the outside world either. Um, the prison is really, a, um, you know, people talk about microcosm, macrocosm. I'd go further. The prison is just like society outside, but it's under a microscope or it's in a pressure yeah. cooker. You find all the same yeah. things. They're just extreme, which is why Shakespeare is really good because that's Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare is just human relations, but pushed to the extreme. So one of the pieces we often start with in the, when we're working with, the, with men in the men's prison is after we've played games for quite a while, the first piece of Shakespeare that I tend to introduce is Richard II and his speech. I've been studying how to compare this prison where I live unto the world. So it's King Richard in a prison, finding himself in prison. And, you know, yeah, and that's because I expect that the, um, the inmates will be able to easily relate to some parts of that speech. Mm. And they can and do. And often they, they judge Richard. You know, they're like, oh, man, if you're overthinking this. You're doing your time hard. You just got to forget <laughs> this stuff. You know, so their advice to Richard would be don't think, stop thinking. Interesting. Um, but given that he is thinking, um, uh, you know, what is what is he thinking? And, uh, you know, have they had those ideas? But the thing is that when Shakespeare wants to explore the experience of someone who was free, suddenly incarcerated, he doesn't put you or me in the prison. He puts the King of England, right? 
uh, and not any old king, the king who believed he ruled by divine right. So that yeah. was Richard II. He really believed in the divine right of kings. You take that person who is the top of the top of the top and you place him not just in prison, you place him in solitary confinement in a bare cell, right? So, and Shakespeare's always doing this. He's like, I want to explore this. What's the biggest version of that I can find? Yeah. So it really suits the prison environment, which is, okay, it's not like oranges. Well, okay, it is like oranges. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, to go and have a look at a couple like episodes. Prisoner. It's not, yeah, it's not, um, it is and it isn't, but it is certainly yeah. a place where things get really uh, blown up. Yeah. Pressure cooker, because you are literally confined. Microscope, because you are. People are looking at you. you know, All the time. Blah, blah, blah. So what are these things that are promoted by doing drama? Well, one of them, and, and so it's a combination of Shakespeare, of dramatic practice, and our own approach, the way that we approach Shakespeare. And we approach it that way because we think it's, the best way for us it's the best way to approach Shakespeare which is somewhat democratically so it, with that whole sitting in a circle that whole collective or collaborative rather than collective decision making that's all stuff we do in our own company yeah um in the and you see that in rehearsal rooms all over everywhere you know actors yeah. get together the first thing they do is get in a circle and yeah. communicate they know to do that right in a prison that's like whoa the teachers are sitting on, and they keep calling us teachers, even though we insist we're not teachers. Interesting. We are jokers um, and we're, we're, we're actors, artists, whatever. Um, and uh, that's, that's new, that's novel. And one of the things that the prisoners say is, I loved coming to Shakespeare because I got treated like a person. Wow. The implication, and quite often stated, is that's not how they're treated the rest of the time. Yeah. Um, we've had people say, uh, I, I love going to Shakespeare. It's the only time in here that I feel like I am myself. And that's a real eye opener because it's like, that's wait a second. Huge. You come to a place where your job is to pretend to be someone else acting. And that's when you feel like yourself. Right? So that got me thinking. And it's because they are playing a role in the prison. Um, yeah. So in the prison, there is such a thing as a mask of the prisoner. There's a way you're expected to behave. One of the um, guys who did quite a few of our projects in the early years of the project, after he was released, he was on a, a panel, public panel, talking about it. And he said, and I'll never forget this, it's so powerful. He said, in prison, the only emotion you're allowed to express is anger. And even then, you have to be very circumspect about how you do it. So, uh, and that's what I talk about the pressure cooker or the microscope, yeah. because our society also sets rules on what emotions can be expressed, where and how. Yep. In the prison, it's extreme. It's like you just don't express emotions, yep. except anger, and then you watch how you do it or there's going to be trouble. And so there, there is a mask and there is generally, that's a generalisation. Uh, it's a fairly sound one. There is a literal mask that goes with being a prisoner. Yeah. Body and spirit. Interesting. There's a way you look, there's a way you talk, and it's a character you're playing for the time that you're in there. Yeah. Um, when you walk into an acting workshop, before you can play any other character, you have to take that mask off. So once that mask comes off, and we see men laughing, giggling, skipping, yes, crying, mourning things about their own life, crying about the fact that they're in prison, which is something you could never do otherwise no. in prison. And we have to be very careful, you know, about how, you know, that's managed. But the guys, the circle really supports each other. Amazing. Uh, so I've slipped into guys because I have mostly worked with men. Yep. We've also worked with women. I've worked with women a, li a little bit. Um, but so you're creating in this very oppressive uh, place a little bubble of permission. Right? Mm. But that's also true of what theatre companies do. That is, yep. when you come into a rehearsal or a workshop, you are invited to be less inhibited than you would be in your daily life. It's no different. Absolutely. Right? You take off the mask of Paul, I take off the mask of Rob, and allow myself to explore different ways of being. And one of those will eventually be become whatever character or characters I'm playing. It's just the extremity 
it's less yeah. extreme in everyday society. In the prison, it's extreme. So that that little permission um, becomes huge and everything. Yeah. So uh, the men talk about that. Uh, oh, and the women talk about that too. They talk about being treated with respect, treated as equals. They, uh, uh, they talk about the value of playing characters in a way that is... Hmm, I'll actually quote a guy that I, uh, a prisoner in Italy, when I went, I did it. Oh, yeah, here's the book. Here's the book. I wrote ah, this excellent. book. <laughs> Prison of Shakespeare, which is far too expensive because it's an academic book. So a library may have it, but we will give you a link so that if you yeah. really want to spend money on it, you can. Um, Prison Shakespeare for these deep shames and great indignities. And people go, oh, I love the subtitle. Of course you do, because that's the part that Shakespeare wrote. Um, <laughs> that's from Comedy of Errors. So um, Prison Shakespeare, the book itself is an attempt to situate the global phenomenon of Shakespeare in prisons. So it starts with a history of Shakespeare in prisons. Uh, then there is a chapter that is a case study on the work that we'd done up to the point that that was written. But then the rest of it is like comparing different programs that exist and like, how are they similar? How are they different? And you find that even when they're run quite differently, a lot of the same outcomes are cited. Uh, so as part of the research for that, I went to Rome, where I, I um, met, worked with, played with uh, Fabio Cavalli, who runs um, three prison companies inside a Roman prison. Um, and I uh, worked um, with one company. Oh, and this prison has a theatre inside the prison, like a purpose-built theatre that is way better equipped than most of the theatres that I get to work in in the free world, right? It's wow. a theater in the prison. Isn't that cool? That's and awesome. yet Italian prisons have been cited by the United Nations as being in violation of human rights. They are horrible places, but you've got to have your theater. But you've got to have a theater. I'm allowed to do that because I'm Italian. So I'm allowed to make fun of my, my not my accent. Anyway, um, so, uh, and, and I said to this guy who'd been, they'd been doing Julius Caesar for like four years. Uh, and they performed it like every six months or so. And there's this one guy who'd been doing it for four years. And I said, don't you get bored of doing this play? And he's like, no, because I've, I've gotten to play, uh, I think, three different characters. I'm like, oh, okay. And then he said, every time I play a character, I learn something new because in order to, and every actor should take this on board, yeah. many do, in order to speak those words, I must think those thoughts. And in order to think those thoughts, I have to be able to stand in their shoes and see the world from their perspective. And that is the definition of empathy. Yeah. Right. So empathy isn't about, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to feel exactly the same. Um, you know, it's empathy is just about being able to understand what someone's going through from their perspective, whether you agree with it or not. Yeah. And so this, and, and, that is profound for anyone, obviously. Um, but especially in a prison context, I mean, empathy is not one of the things that we're trying to build. Yes. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, because in Australia, in the Australian prison context, it's all about job skills. They figured if people are employable, they won't commit crime. Like the corrective system pays no attention to what the actual causes of crime are. They've yeah. got these... Uh, it's basically what the politicians can sell. You know, they, and one thing that's always easy to sell is get tough on crime, by which they mean get tough on people who commit crime, you know, lock them away, treat them, treat them harshly. Um, that would be like getting tough on cancer by taking everyone who had cancer and putting them on an island away from someone somewhere else, right? So where crime is seen as a problem of the individual making choices... But if that were true, we wouldn't see these, you know, criminal behaviours tending to arise out of poverty, yeah. um, out of uh, generational trauma, out of um, educational disparity, out of, um, out of prejudice on the basis of things like race and so forth. Criminal behaviour has social causes. So we're not going social and, and cognitive causes. So it's not going to get solved by going sit in the corner and have a good hard think about what you've done. And while you're here, 
learn these job skills. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's not addressing the actual cause. And just like when we want to get tough on cancer, we do research into what causes cancer and then attempt to deal with that. Right. But that's, that's too Great hard analogy. to sell. Politicians yeah. can sell tough on crime much easier. So one of the things that, that and people report this growth in empathy. So we've had, um, you know, they say, oh, I can, I can understand. I always thought that people who insert thing here were stupid or wrong, but now I can understand where, where they might be coming from. We had one guy say that after, well, it's his quote, I'm going to misquote him, but after weeks of the silliest games and the, the making the strangest noises and doing oddest things that I'd ever done in my life, I began to feel the hurt that I'd caused. So it's this kind of, it's this sort of opening up um, that comes with it. And as I said before, these are things that if you want to be an actor and particularly a Shakespearean actor, you have to learn. Amazing. So it's it's taking those skills and not doing anything different than we would do with actors anywhere else. But in that context, they take on greater meaning and hopefully um, a greater use. We're trying to, now that the project's been running for a while, we're trying to look at some, you know, figures. We've got some criminologists looking at figures. But those sorts of things are very hard to, yeah. uh, to argue because, thankfully, you can't do a control experiment. <laughs> you need longitudinal data and you need huge numbers, you know. Um, but there have been some studies done around the world that, that show that some of this is true. So for us, we are not using Shakespeare as therapy. And there are programs around the place where they'll go in and they won't even necessarily put on a show at the end. They will instead go, let's look at this Shakespeare speech. And then they'll dig out, they'll, they'll consciously, uh, sorry, deliberately dig out, how does that relate to you? and to your life. And it, then it becomes therapy. Yeah. And I don't want to criticize that, but I know that I would run screaming from that if it were me. Yeah. But that's just me. I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to yeah. that sort of thing. Don't like people wanting to fix me. I cannot so be what, fixed. Um, <laughs> so instead, what is the purpose of the project going into the prisons and why, why is it? All oh, right. Up? Well, it has those outcomes, but it has those outcomes in a different way. So yep. people will reflect on their own lives, but they're not forced to, right? Mm -hmm. And the outcomes are building, okay, so there was a study done uh, from a public health perspective on what's the social determinants of health. So this is something that's well known in public health is that where you find increases in these things, people have better health outcomes, mental and physical. Where you find a lack of these things, people have worse. And they looked at our program. This study was done uh, um, by Emma Hurd, who then went on to do a PhD on forum theatre and domestic violence in Samoa. Um, and Dr. Hurd is now back in Queensland doing amazing work uh, relating to sexual assault on university campuses, not research. She's actually uh, instigating programs at the University wow. of Queensland to, to address this. So, yay. So Emma's research, um, and I think I can probably put a link to that as well. Right. I'm like the fourth or fifth author on that, but I didn't really write it. I just welcomed her into the program, really. Um uh, is uh, shows that some of the outcomes, demonstrable outcomes of our program are increases in um, positive support networks. So everyone talks about support networks, but positive support networks and um, communication skills, particularly around affect, which is a fancy word for emotions. Right. So it actually leads to an increase in people's ability to talk their emotions. And both of those things are recognised social determinants of health. So, you know, that's one of the things we do. We go in there and we say, look, we're just coming in to put on a play, um, you know, and uh, but we don't say, hey, we're just here to give you, you know, have some time to have fun. It is that, and it should yeah. be that, because fun is not fun for no reason. Um, and I, ah, oh, here we go. This is this is in the book. Rehabilitation, right? That's the thing we're all interested in. How yeah. does this rehabilitate? Etymology. So I'll put on my linguist hat for a moment. Rehabilitate from the Latin root habilis, as in habiliments. Uh, habilis meaning to fit, right? Um, or to conform. So to rehabilitate means to make someone conform again, 
right? Ooh, uh, interesting. My, my mate Kurt uh, Toftland, who yeah. you know is the founder of Shakespeare Behind Bars in the US, he doesn't like the word rehabilitate because he says you can't rehabilitate someone who was never habilitate in the, in the first place. And that when you hear the individual stories and the collective stories of the people you meet in prisons, they were never habilitated. The, the context, again, the generational trauma, the social yeah. condition, the, the prejudice they faced. And, and then I don't like it because, you know, I'm a bit of a rebel and I'm not sure I like the idea of making someone conform, you know? Yeah. So, okay, so if it's not rehabilitation, what is it? Is it just recreation? And I'm like, wait, drop the just. Recreation. Look at that word. Yeah. Recreate. We don't have recreation as a species because it makes us smile. Well, <laughs> it does make us smile, but why? It's because we need that as human beings. It's important for us to have recreation because it's in those activities that we explore find new ways that we can be and whether that recreation is is performing shakespeare painting playing the guitar or freaking basket weaving recreational activities are exactly that opportunities to recreate and that that is incredibly powerful so i would say we are a recreational activity in the literal etymological sense of the word. Big thanks to Rob Pensilfini, Artistic Director of the Queensland Shakespeare Ensemble. Now, QSE do amazing work with Shakespeare, and you can learn a little bit more about that through the links in the description below. And down there will also be a link to the mini playlist of all the videos that I shot with Rob around aspects of Shakespeare. He is a wealth of knowledge, so definitely check that out. Uh, it would be great if you give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and if you haven't already, share it with someone who you think might need it. Thanks very much. Have a look at some of these other Shakespeare videos, and I will see you there.